um, the fellows at the Washington Institute go to the region fairly often. Um, but the question really comes down to when and what's the most opportune time and, and why to go. The reason why I made my last journey was because of the veto in early February that we saw at the Security Council um, by the Russians and the Chinese of yet another Security Council resolution. It was there that I began to, to really fully appreciate something that I had detected um, in the weeks leading up to that um, when the administration went, I would say, very quite silent um, as the different drafts were being sort of uh, handed back and forth between different sides. But there was a fundamental disconnect between U.S. policy um, and that of other countries also, as well, Western countries and, um, as, especially, and events on the ground um, in Syria. Now, as most of you know, because not just because of my book, but because of my positions, I'm not allowed to go to Syria. And most of you aren't either, and probably wouldn't want to go. But, so the, but if you really want to get a, a, a sense of what's going on um, in Syria, all you need to do is go to southern Turkey or, or, or northern Lebanon. And that's, and that's what I spend a majority of my time doing on my trip. Um, I began, uh, however, with a, uh, with a, 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 I entered Turkey through Istanbul, as many of you do when you visit the country, um, and carried out a number of meetings there with, uh, with Syrian oppositionists. I was shocked at the numbers that were in Istanbul. Um, not only those that were in, you know, sort of in, in exile, but those that had come out of Homs only a few days before, and were going back into Homs a couple of days after that, many of whom worked for revolutionary councils, extremely brave people. Um, who, you know, telling very harrowing accounts of how they got it, how they got out, and and uh, and they were very fearful about going back in. Um, the situation, as uh, you can imagine, there was quite bad. The, the good thing about the Syrian revolution is that um, is that these videos speak a million or more words. So it's very hard. Uh, it's very hard for for different interests to hide what's going on on the ground, and and um, and those interests could be. Um, uh, people who are in the Assad regime, um, and it makes it very hard for um, for, for governments um, to react policy-wise um, to to events uh, that are evolving inside of the country. The thing that struck me from my interviews with the Syrian opposition in Istanbul is that there's an enormous amount of tension between the opposition within Syria and the Syrian National Council, and we're just going to have to live with that, um, and we're going to have to accept it. Until now, our position has been to back the Syrian National Council, although at arm's length, um, through conversations, through assistance, um, and actually there's been quite a bit of work and resources thrown towards that effort. Um, that's not going to be enough um, to, to deal with the opposition as a whole. Um, I even had members of the Syrian National Council badmouth the Syrian National Council to me um, in person um, because of what they said was the secretive nature of the organization, especially at the top. Now, I've met, I know the Syrian National Council well, I know its leadership, I've interviewed Borhan Ghaliun. I think a lot of these things actually were, were, were untrue. Uh, some of them were, though, I think true, but it, definitely the perception of the SNC not representing their interests was, to me, universal in nearly everyone I spoke with when I was in Istanbul. I also had meetings with journalists who had recently entered and then come back out of Syria particularly Idlib province. It was very interesting. I'm going to keep the names out of it, but you know, I think, most of them. Um, and, and it included the, the team that um, went in and then uh, with uh, Anthony Shadid um, and, and was with him um, in his last days. Uh, they saw extensive weapon smuggling from Turkey into Idlib province, um, but mostly small arms. And, um, and that uh, process uh, was, was something that seemed to be I wouldn't say encouraged by the Turks, but I think that I think that people knew that it was going on. Apparently, a lot of the, the weapons trade inside of Idlib province, according to what they learned, um, Syrian officers um, sell their weapons to Turkish smugglers inside of Syria, who then turn around and don't even cross the border; they just sell it back to the Syrian opposition. So, you know, Levantine people, most first and foremost, entrepreneurial, not extremists, right? I mean, this is just, and anybody who's spent time in that in that region, I think, would um, would agree. Maybe not with all groups, but by and large. Um, uh, also, the, the picture inside, that they painted, these journalists, inside of Idlib province is, is chaotic. Um, uh, and most importantly, there's uh, Idlib, you know, you, you've heard a lot of talk about there being Islamic extremists in Syria and a lot of talk about al-Qaeda, even by government officials. Um, 
most of that talk originates out of concerns from Idlib province, okay? And there, there are different sort of theaters to the conflict um, um, in, you know, inside of Syria, which I'll get into in a moment. But Idlib is, the, is, is one of the poorest and, and one of the most conservative areas um, of Syria. And so it's no surprise that, that journalists going in uh, to that area found lots of people uh, who were uh, poor, pious Muslims, um, and, and men with beards. Um, and some of those men with beards had guns. However, um, and this included the New York Times team, um, who were you know, looking for Libyans, and I think this Tyler Hicks's account of, of their trip, I think, is out there now. Uh, they didn't find any. Um, and they didn't find any members of Al-Qaeda either. Um, however, that doesn't mean that uh, there aren't uh, forces in Idlib province which uh, share our short-term interests of ousting Assad, but not our long-term interests of, of a secular Syria. Um, there's at least one Salafi sheikh uh, in Id Idlib province near Samarine. Um, he apparently has about a thousand men under arms. Um, uh, the funding for uh, his group, uh, apparently, as well as a number of other groups, are coming from individuals uh, in the Arab Gulf, and it's being funneled via Turkey, um, many of which are apparently in informal relationships. Um, the, the journalists said that they were much reticent. They were not. They were. They really didn't want to talk about that aspect, and that's not surprising. I then went to Ankara and met with Turkish officials, um, and I noticed immediately a shift. The last time I was in Turkey was in late summer. Then, in order for Turkey to do anything on Syria, you needed a the United Nations Security Council resolution. That's it. Now it's a different story. Uh, Turkey no longer requires that. Um, it, it requires um, a coalition of countries, um, it requires perhaps the UN being involved, um, and it most importantly requires a majority of the Syrian people uh, to be involved. So there's a, there's, a, there's a shift there, and I think that was as a result of what I would find out, which I'll discuss a little bit when I went down to the border, their readings of what was going on inside of Syria and where this conflict was going. I then went from, uh, I traveled back to Istanbul, then down to, um, down to Antakya. I had to fly into Adana because the airfield at, um, in Hatay was flooded. The Syrians have opened the, um, the, uh, the flood dikes along the Orontes River. There's an extremely, extreme amount of rainfall this year, um, which actually shows how dedicated the Syrian protesters have been this winter because it's one of the worst winters on record um, in the Levant, and although, it's the, although it's the warmest here in D.C. Um, and when you, when, you, when you go to Ant Antakya, and, and very much like when you go to northern Lebanon, um, it's, and I, I explained this to Rob when I got back, and I've been a lot of, a lot of you know that I've spent a lot of time in the region, been all over the place, and I've seen some very interesting things. Uh, this, you know, explaining this trip um, was a bit like the film Twister. I don't know if any of you have ever seen it. There were a group of us, uh, a team um, of people, and we were going to, met, you know, and it was like this film in that, you know, in this film you have Jodie Foster, She's going to chase after this tornado and try to measure it, right? And that's really what we were trying to do. We were trying to measure this storm. And in many ways, what's going on in Syria is a storm. On the one side, you have a, 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 a minority-dominated regime with a 42-year track record of being unable to do one thing, and that's reform. It can't reform. Everybody knows that it can't reform. Okay? On the other side, you have an opposition which comes, which is based in the fact that Syria is the youngest population in the Middle East outside the Palestinian territories. Okay. And these two forces are just swirling around each other. And it's as if you, you, when you get down to the border, you can actually feel it. And the um, and people, the, the Syrian opposition there, uh, or rather, the Syrian refugees who are there, you hear about the camps, and I visited one of the camps with the permission of the Turkish Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Um, it was at Yalada, it was a camp of about 2,000 people. I found people there very well cared for, um, and, uh, and they spent a lot of time with me. Many of them had, been in, had left the Syrian coast or had left Idlib province um, in the earlier part of the uprising. And, um, and they, uh, they were adamant that they were not going back um, anytime soon, um, especially until the Assad regime fell. Um, and the, the Turks didn't seem like they, that they were eager for them to, uh, uh, to go home either, to, um, to, their, to their credit. But these are just the refugees that, that are counted in the camps. There, what, what really shocked me is that Antakya, Hatay province, is full of Syrians who just live with their families, the families straddle the border there, or they just rent apartments. And it's there where you can meet with members of, this, of the 
both the, the civilian opposition as well as the Free Syrian Army. And that was part of the reason why I went to Antakya. And was that uh, until that time, the um, uh, you know, notices on Facebook and in the news about the Free Syrian Army uh, were prevalent, but understanding uh, exactly who they were and what, they, and what their aims were and how well organized they were, this was outside of my comprehension here from DC. And at the same time, the government's comprehension as well, because the US had a very strict policy of not speaking with the armed opposition in Syria, particularly the Free Syrian Army. No conversations were to go on, officially. Um, and so I was able to go in Antakya and sit down with members of the Free Syrian Army to have very, very long and detailed discussions. Um, and a couple of things I, I carried away, they're better organized than we think, um, but they, it's very clear that they, didn't, they, they have not adopted a linear structure um, which has been the bar at which you know, many people have, uh, have put the bar at, you know, there concerning possible U.S. assistance, um, mostly because they were afraid of being decapitated. Um, the, and it's here that I learned that the Free Syrian Army is of three variants. One are, def, are dis, um, deserters from the Syrian military in Turkey, who work with deserters from, deserters from the mil Syrian military inside of the country. And then you have local people who have picked up arms to defend protesters in different communities all over Syria, sort of akin to Minutemen in the American Revolution. Um, and these three operate under the Sy Free Syrian Army franchise. And um, we have very detailed discussions about what they want. Interestingly, um, and this applies to all the opposition that I met with in the region, both the civil and the armed, they all wanted weapons. Um, they didn't want weapons because they, they're trigger happy. They wanted weapons because it was very, it was apparent to them that international intervention was not coming and that they were going to um, have to defend themselves in the short term and be in the long term in order to bring down the Assad regime they thought that it would have to include um, an armed element. Then I went to Lebanon and had an opportunity to meet there with very similar activists, um, both in the civil and the armed opposition um, who are in Lebanon. Um, and they told me virtually the same thing. Um, but they also detailed for me, really, the level of atrocities in Homs and particularly Bab Amr. And, you know, I think in this entire conflict, very much there is before Bab Amr and after Bab Amr. I mean, when you have a community which is bombarded for nearly a month with rocket fire, um, it's no wonder that, you would, that, you ha that the U.S. government is beginning to explore some of its options because it became very clear to, um, to the opposition um, as well as to everyone Either, whether they were in Turkey or in Lebanon, um, and I'll get into this in the conclusion, that Assad is not going to go away, is not going to go anywhere anytime soon without a kick of some type. I met also with Lebanese political leaders um, who gave me a real earful about what was going on inside of Syria, some predictions, some plans about perhaps what to do, and then just some frustration, including a, um, a, a, a Walid Jumblat uh, late in the day and without wine throwing a map of Syria at me. Um, as he expressed frustration for U.S. policy um, and its, its lack um, of support for, um, for the Syrian opposition. Analytically, my conclusions boil down to this. This crisis will not settle down anytime soon. And there are a lot of people here in D.C. who predicted that. And a lot of people here in D.C. who spent, who, who, who made their policy bets on that. I don't see any evidence of it. The Assad, and, and making this even more complicated, if you've noticed, the, you know, the Assad regime has moved into Homs and then Hama and then up into Idlib province. Um, and it's true that they're, they're, they're killing a lot of people and they're in many areas, you know, temporarily uh, clearing these areas of armed elements, but they spring back up. If you look at the protest map every day, um, you can see that actually the, the protesters continue to come out in the streets, not only elsewhere in Syria, but in the area in which the Syrian regime is operating. So. They're, they're temporarily clearing areas, but they're unable to hold them. This is a big problem for the Assad regime, big problem. Um, and perhaps went into part of their calculations concerning accepting Kofi Annan's six-point plan today, although there are, you know, it's, it's very early to see whether that will be actually implemented or not. Um, and I think that this, this sense that this will not settle down anytime soon is much different than the feeling that I got last August when I thought actually that this just might be on a slow boil um, for a while, um, and then we would have to see where, where, where things would go. Second, Assad is not going to step aside anytime soon without a change in U.S. and Western policy to work 
the syrian to work syria from the ground up until now we've had sanctions which you know and many fellows here have worked on in detail we have one of the most comprehensive sanctions policies in the world right now in place against the Assad regime we have a lot of diplomacy going on both of the UN Security Council and elsewhere in the Arab League these are not working the best way to put pressure on Assad to actually cut a deal and for him to exit the country is to work it from the ground up and I think that the best way to do that is to support the Syrian opposition from within Syria in addition to the Syrian National Council I don't think the Syrian National Council should be dumped by any sense I mean you know we're still very early in this process but you'll notice that Ben Rhodes readout from President Obama and Prime Minister Erdogan's discussions ahead of the Friends of the Syrian people meeting on April 1 mentioned specifically non-lethal aid to groups within Syria I think that that is a subtle shift in in the US approach I think that they're exploring this option in particular we should not expect there will be a single address for the Syrian opposition for a while and this is because of the nature of the crackdown by the Assad regime as well as their level of organization at the moment the US probably will have to back different groups in different areas in different theaters okay and this is where there's another big takeaway from the from the from the trip there's a theater in Idlib there's a theater in Homs and there's a theater in Dara there's lots of other things going on in the country but these are the three main areas of concerted action armed and unarmed in each one of those areas that different groups are influential so revolutionary councils for example are very influential in Homs and also in Dara but in Dara prominent families are also very influential inside of those councils so you know there's gonna have to be a subtle difference in how we back the opposition in those two areas the real wild card here is Idlib because as you know Rob talked about and and I alluded to earlier in my in my presentation we do have groups in that area um, uh, which do not share US long-term policy goals so and they're being funded it appears according to reports by groups and individuals from the Gulf so the question is do we allow those that funding just to go on and not get involved at all and allow people to place their bets in what could become a proxy war inside of Syria or a proxy struggle at the very least or do we start to explore our options in that area and try to find people with whom we can work um, and perhaps could work with other uh, affiliates of the free Syrian army uh, franchise um, last but not least the way this um, despite all the emphasis on the armed opposition in Syria and you see it constantly in the news now and there's more talk about the free Syrian army than there is perhaps about anything the the combination that will work best on the Assad regime and the Syrian oppositionists were uniform in this even the armed elements is a combination of civil resistance which has not stopped against the Assad regime in fact it's increased and that I mean by public protest boycotts and so on combined with armed resistance against the regime and these two the regime's reactions to these two forms of resistance or disobedience um, will put it and members of the regime into dilemmas where they're going to be forced to choose whether they stay on the Assad regime's train or they decide to jump off or perhaps even decouple their community's car from that train we're very far from that point at the moment I think that the, one of the main reasons why the Russians um, in addition to their to their long interest inside of Syria which actually are you know, fairly understandable I think one you know, takeaway one thing I could perhaps agree with them on is that I think they sense like everyone else in the region does that Assad is just not in, has not been placed in a position has not been placed in a, into a dilemma where he has where he makes a decision whether to stay and die or go and live and until he gets closer to that I think that the Russians quite rightly are going to bet that Assad will hold on the question is is that in US interest for Assad to hold on well I don't think that it is obviously most of you know me and know my positions on this but I'll but and I, I can't exactly tell you how the process is going to work but I can definitely tell you that after that you know let's say six months from now Syria is going to be a much much different place it's going to be much worse off economically I think the level of funding to, to armed elements inside the country is going to go up dramatically 
as different diplomatic initiatives fail. I, I, I think that um, also um, it's very likely that we're going to see a separation perhaps of the humanitarian and the, um, and, and, and the track to bring down Assad. And I think that's what we've seen in the, in the Kofi Annan six-point plan. It's true it's about a political transition inside of Syria. Um, but uh, on the other hand, I don't, you know, getting back to my original, uh, original theme, I don't see any kind of accommodation between these two forces, between a regime that can't reform and an opposition that's just so young and because of the brutality of the regime's crackdown, headless. So even if the Assad regime wanted to bargain, which it does right now, with whom would it bargain? And who would dare stick their head above uh, the fray? in order to negotiate with him. And with that, I'll end.